Uh, well, thank all of you for the very nice introductions and uh, um, for the invitation, but especially for what's been a really wonderful day for me. I've really enjoyed uh, meeting with faculty members, students. I had a wonderful morning at California Department of Education, which just really thrilled me. Um, and we even had, had snuck in a surprise visit uh, with your governor which uh, totally kind of blew me away. But it's been a wonderful day, and uh, this is one of uh, my favorite parts of my job, uh, being able to visit universities, whether we have grants there or not, and uh, to meet the uh, hardworking, energetic uh, faculty members and students who are doing wonderful things. So what I want to talk today, uh, the title is Connecting, Res Conducting Research to Improve Practice policy and theory in education. And I'm going to try to chunk this talk up into three distinct sections that I hope by the time I'm done sort of uh, we can connect the dots. Uh, the first part is really about this idea of conducting relevant and useful research uh, in order to build better understanding and theories of improvement uh, through closer partnerships between practitioners, policymakers, and researchers. And then my second part, I'm really going to totally shift gears and um, talk about two topics that I think need more research. And these are sort of, this is kind of a personal perspective. It's not an institutional government perspective at all. And then I think where I hope to tie it together is to talk about some things that I think are sk uh, skill sets that our next generation of researchers need that you university folks are preparing for, and from what I gathered talking to graduate students this afternoon, that are probably eager for. So I probably shouldn't spend much time talking about IES, because you've got the picture, where the government's arm for education research, and evaluation, statistics, and assessments. We do this through four separate centers, uh, the largest of which is the National Center for Education Statistics, which is probably best known for conducting the nation's report card, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. But they do, do a ton of other stuff. They're a federal statistical agency. So almost any time you see a newspaper article or a, ma a magazine article about education in the United States, you're almost always going to find a citation from the National Center for Education Statistics. Our evaluation center conducts federally mandated uh, evaluations of federal programs, uh, usually mandated by Congress. But it also has a regional assistance and knowledge utilization component, which funds the regional education laboratories that I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about um, more in a few minutes, and runs the What Works Clearinghouse and uh, ERIC. You remember Eric? Well, Eric is alive and well, and really uh, doing quite well. Um, so this, as a scientific research and evaluation agency, one of the biggest things that we need to do is be seen as objective and nonpartisan. So one reason I have a six-year term is so that I could span administrations. Um, we have some separation of powers from the Department of Education so that we're not unduly influenced. Uh, we have our own review process. Uh, we, we have a fair amount of autonomy. Although, at the same time, we're trying to balance this objectivity and autonomy with doing work that's relevant to the policies of the department. So we, we want to speak to the department needs, uh, the country's needs, but we want to make sure that we're seen as uh, objective and trustworthy. Uh, in FY12, our budget is just under 600 million, and the president actually proposed a about a 4% increase for IES in FY13. So, starting off my my shtick about relevance and usability, and this is something uh, which are sort of a very personal goal for me, that that's what I want to accomplish in my six years at IES. So, so I feel like I talk about it everywhere I go, and sometimes I wonder, well, John, you're saying the same thing over and over. 
Well, I, I'm saying it over and over because I'm going to make the point, and I want to drill it in, and I'm, I'm not going to give up on it. Uh, so uh, three more years of this. Um, I, I really think that the work that the research community does can be more relevant and usable to practitioners and, and policymakers. And, and I'm also trying to build an argument that this greater relevance and usability is also uh, a way for us to build better science, a way for us to build a better theory of school uh, improvement, uh, help us understand more about what it takes to have better teaching, more student learning, and how to develop policies and practices that we need to put in place to reach these goals. You know, we often talk, I talk, I hear a lot of people say, well, we've got to move uh, from this approach of looking at what works to really digging into the why does it work, where does it work, for whom does it work, under what conditions. Um, there are times when we know, need to know what works because uh, you may have to make a choice among products, you have to uh, pay for something or buy something. So we want some evidence about whether this has any kind of uh, effectiveness behind it. But this approach, I think, is really uh, too narrow for us to really build the science about for school improvement. Um, and, uh, in addition to this, uh, we do need to understand what works in some situations. But I think equally important and less understood and less practiced is that we also have to learn how to make it work, which is learning about context, which is learning about variability, which is learning about local conditions. So IES has gained um, this big reputation for rigor. And I think rigorous evaluation, rigorous research uh, is kind of a catchword for IES. And in, in large part, uh, we can thank my predecessor, uh, the first director of IES, Russ Whitehurst, for coming in and really raising standards for research. And his, his particular concern was that when research was trying to make causal claims, it needed to have a kind of methodology behind it that allowed for causal claims. And that they would rule out uh, alternative explanations. So he really pushed hard to get the research community on board, for one thing, conducting randomized controlled trials, for other things, using more rigorous quasi-experimental designs. So uh, I see my job as kind of moving the pendulum back to a kind of a sweet spot where, we, yes, we're concerned with rigor, but we're also equally concerned about relevance and, and usability. Um, one of the things that I think is a challenge for me, I, I actually toss this out to a group, uh, it's an intellectual challenge for me, is that how do we move IES from kind of a, a sole focus on first you develop an intervention, then you test it out and find that it's got some efficacy, and then you scale it up or validate it. So it's a sort of a very linear view of the process of improvement. And I think we've got to do a better job here um, on understanding uh, the systems that surround these interventions, uh, how they work, and sort of uh, be more attuned to the sort of complexities of life in schools and districts that many of these interventions miss. So um, yes, we still want to develop and validate interventions, but we have to do it in a way that is really mindful of the variability of the world and the need for kind of uh, thinking of development as a continuous improvement cycle. So my goal, uh, all of my thoughts about education research and what we should be doing is just so clearly influenced by this work in Chicago, uh, where I was for, for 30 years. Some of those years I worked directly for the school district. 
most of those years I worked either at the University of Chicago or another um, nonprofit research group. And it was solely focused on doing research that supported school improvement efforts. Which isn't to say that we wanted to be in the back pocket of the school district, but we did see our job as to do research that would either inform, enhance, or improve um, improvement of efforts. So we saw ourselves as uh, partners to the school district. And I just uh, loved doing research. I think I was uh, uh, kind of born with the instincts of a social scientist. So I, I, I feel like I lived the life of a social scientist. I loved to analyze and interpret data. But in the work in Chicago, I grew to appreciate another part of the work uh, just as much, and that was interacting with school district leadership, understanding the problem from their perspective, understanding how to conduct research that could influence uh, their decision making, and then how to actually follow up and continue to study that. So that, that, that not only were we building the researchers' capacity to respond to the needs of the school district, but sort of uh, less well-spoken is we were trying to build capacity in the school district to become more analytic themselves about how they tried new things, tested them out, and evaluated them. So as I've said, I think that these partnerships have a kind of a, a dual benefit. Not only do they focus the researchers on the problems of practice that districts and schools are, are uh, grappling with, but they have a very quick fit for the district who, when they've got some investment in the work, they've got some sort of skin in the game, and when they, they trust it because it's local and they trust the people they're working with, they're much more likely to take it up. They're much more likely uh, to say, well, we need to do something about you know, a lot of uh, practitioners and policymakers don't trust research that was done someplace else. And so, well, we're not like that. That's not us. That's a big city. We're a small city. So, when it's this kind of local research done in this partnership, I think there's greater, much greater opportunity um, for use. So, I'm going to talk about two studies that we did uh, that give a little bit of a flavor of some of this work. And these studies are really very different. Uh, one was a, a decade-long, huge study, and the other one was quite self-contained. But I'm trying to draw lessons about theory building and understanding school improvement as a process, as rather than a bunch of discrete programs. So there were five of us who worked together uh, on this long-term project looking at schools that made substantial improvements over many years following a big school decentralization project in the early 90s. This was a legislated um, devolution of authority from the school board to local schools, and it provided kind of a natural experiment for schools that looked very much the same at the beginning over time, really uh, changed in different ways with some showing long-term sustained improvements and others either stagnating or getting uh, worse. So this is a book that somebody in the introduction mentioned called Organizing Schools for Improvement Lessons from Chicago. Uh, the lead author was Tony Blake, who at the time was at the University of Chicago, has since moved to Stanford and now is president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and three other colleagues, Penny Sebring, Elaine Allensworth, and Stuart Professor. So through a very careful measurement in all Chicago public elementary schools, through student and teacher surveys on a biannual basis, we measured a number of concepts that we uh, should have collected evidence to believe that these are the factors that differentiated the improvement improving schools from the stagnating schools. We call these the five essential supports for student learning. Strong leadership, strong parent and community ties, 
strong professional culture among teachers, a student-centered learning climate, and a strong instructional guidance system. So in our research, we, we also um, show that these five essential supports uh, kind of need to work together in a system that one of these alone isn't going to get you where you want to go, but uh, it's a, a very kind of a complex, interactive, and actually a very social system of our school improvement. Very different from this idea of identifying uh, uh, an off-the-shelf intervention and finding it. So there's a lot of other research that suggests that good schools are much more than, than the sum of discrete programs and interventions. So I'm sure you know from your experience that good schools are, are really learning organizations that value strong leadership, encourage and support innovation, use data for continuous improvement, hire good teachers, support and develop them, and encourage collaborative efforts. They make good programmatic decisions, and they constantly change uh, tweak and re revise. I talk about these ideas a lot, and I often uh, cite uh, the work of a friend and colleague of mine named Charles Payne, who wrote a book a couple of years ago called So Much Reform, So Little Change, <laughs> where he explores why what look like very promising interventions actually fail at dysfunctional schools. And he looked, in this study, looked very closely at urban schools in Chicago in highly impoverished neighborhoods where there's tons of student mobility, lots of teacher mobility, not, with not strong leadership. Yet these are the very schools that think they can solve their problems by buying programs. And partly because those schools, like the districts that they sit in, are kind of inundated with salespeople selling these programs most of which don't have a strong evidence base behind them in the first place. But they're sold as miracles, and they, and they don't produce the miracles. Uh, and it, largely because I think that you can't string together a bunch of discrete interventions and call it a school improvement strategy. Uh, Dick Renane, who's an eminent economist at Harvard, makes a very similar point. He says that that low-performing schools uh, can get a little bit better by implementing proven programs to solve very specific problems. But for them to become really good, what they need to do is become learning organizations, like I described earlier. Um, you will probably all know Michael Fullan, who wrote a book called All Systems Go. And he, he, he looks at school improvement from the district level. And a quote from him is, the, the solution is not a program. It is a set of common a small set of common principles and practices relentlessly pursued. What I am finding in our work is that the strongest solutions consist of going from practice to theory. Effective practitioners are critical consumers of research and not implementers of research. So he's kind of turned this paradigm on its side. It's not research to practice and implementation of programs. It's a practice to, to theory. So I actually I really believe that the key to achieving both greater usability and better theory is that we researchers need to work more collaboratively with practitioners and policy makers. I, I believe that these partnerships can engender relevant, useful research that confront the difficult questions, whether they're about teacher preparation and support, about engaging and motivating kids who struggle, about helping schools engage families and communities, about teachers and administrators using data and feedback to improve performance. Uh, encouraging and supporting these partnerships re remains one of my biggest priorities at IES. And as, as again, I think I will get more concrete, I actually believe that this partnership approach uh, will not only help make the research more relevant and useful, but it will help us build better theories of school improvement. 
One more example of some work in Chicago. This is a, a, a smaller study that I did in maybe six months. I, I wrote this paper uh, that I mentioned this morning called The Pathway to 20. And Arnie Duncan was superintendent then, and the school district set a goal about for getting more high school graduates to get a 20 on their ACT. Now, 20 on the ACT is a little low. It's below the benchmarks. It's below the national average. But it is high enough to get uh, most Chicago public high school kids into the Illinois State University system. So uh, he asked me to really dig into this, uh, what it takes to get to 20. And if you know the uh, ACT at all, it has some precursor tests that are on the same scale, explore, plan, and ACT. So you can really track development. So I had to. Um, I worked on this, and I, I spent a lot of time in the district uh, talking to principals, administrators, teachers, and I had a graph that I probably showed a dozen times that looked at the relationship between kids' scores on the eighth grade state math test and on the likelihood of getting 20 on the ACT three years later. So anybody who's ever done anything with test scores knows that test scores predict test scores very well. So, you, so we've got our, we've got our um, eighth grade math scores on the horizontal, our probability of getting a 20 uh, three years later on the vertical. And as you can imagine, you know, there's this almost linear uh, progression. The higher, the better you did in eighth grade, the more likely you to do well. But the surprising thing is, so I took the scale of the eighth grade math scores, and I showed the cuts for the different achievement levels on the Illinois uh, test. So kids who made it to proficient, which is uh, a good, no, actually, this, these were kids who exceeded, I'm sorry, who exceeded state standards in eighth grade had a 60% of get, chance of getting to the 20 three years later. That's okay. When we went down to the kids who just barely met the eighth grade state standard, uh, fewer than 10% of them could get to 20 on the ACT three years later. So, so this sort of immediately, so sort of immediate response from this group, people's like jaws dropping, because it sort of crystallized a whole bunch of questions that nobody had fully understood. You know, why does uh, student performance look good in the elementary schools and all of a sudden it looks terrible in the high schools? Well, the answer was that the assessment systems and the standard setting for those assessment systems were totally out of whack. So we were telling eighth graders that they were meeting state standards when in reality they didn't have a ghost of a chance of being college ready uh, several years later. So, so this was the kind of thing that, that really helped the school district understand something that they didn't know before. And it helped the elementary school people kind of take more ownership for that, that meeting state standards just simply wasn't enough. And that if the state wasn't going to ratchet up their standards the way they should have stood up and done, that the district itself was going to. So this, I, I tell this story because for me it's a, a memory that I'll always have with me of engaging with school leadership around an important topic and being able to shed light on, it, on this issue and actually getting pushed, here comes the theory part, pushed by, back by them with lots of questions about, well, is, is there, does it, happen differently in some schools than others? Are there different students more likely to get to 20 even though they uh, have uh, poor scores earlier? So a bunch of colleagues and I at the consortium really dug into this issue. Well, what kind of conditions in schools enable rapid progress uh, toward meeting that 20? What kind of individual characteristics do kids have that really facilitate this. And because of this work, we really built a nice theory about the importance of academic culture in these schools. 
and a kind of understanding why some high schools that demographically looked so similar, serving the same kind of kids, uh, did so much better uh, with their kids. So we've taken at IES, we've really taken to heart the uh, value of the closer relationship between practitioners and policymakers, and are encouraging them, and uh, actually even requiring them someplace. Um, somebody mentioned uh, there's an IES as a board called the National Board for Education Sciences that two years ago approved a new set of research priorities that address this straight on. The work of the institute is also grounded in the principle that effective education research must address the needs and interests of education practitioners and policymakers, as well as students, parents, and communities members. To this end, the Institute will encourage researchers to develop partnership with stakeholder groups to advance the relevance of the Institute's work, the accessibility of its reports, and the usability of its findings for the day-to-day -day work of education practitioners and policy makers. So I, I, I'm going to go fast here. Uh, a couple of ways we're doing this. I mentioned earlier that we have a huge initiative at IES called Reading for Understanding. It's our largest single investment in a research topic ever, $100 million over six years, to really push the development of reading comprehension in K-12. to uh, We felt that the field was ready for this work because there's been a lot of research about basic skills and decoding and, and word skills that kids are getting. We know how to teach these better, but they're not comprehending. So how can we really push this field. So we're funding five teams that involve about 140 researchers across the country. Actually, this afternoon, I heard a faculty member describe some research that uh, is very uh, part of that network. Uh, this is multidisciplinary. These are psychologists. These are linguists. These are child development experts who are all working together uh, on this. But the point is that they're required to partner with districts to get feedback on what they're doing, to better understand not only what's feasible to, to, to use in schools, but, but what the needs are. Um, the regional uh, labs, uh, our regional, your regional lab is represented here by the CEO, uh, Glenn Beck, who is um, with us today. And she's right in the thick of this. Uh, IES sponsors 10 of these across the country that are designed to provide research and analytic support to their states. And we thought there are a number of uh, very timely issues that we could focus the work of the RELS on. One of these is the state longitudinal data systems. All these huge data systems uh, that I've heard people say, we don't want them to turn into data mausoleums. We want them to be used. So we're asking our RELs to work closely with states and locals around data use, uh, to conduct high quality research and evaluation studies, and also to uh, develop this kind of analytic capacity at, at the leadership level. But the, the main way of doing this is through what we're calling the research alliances. So each REL has put together a limited number of research alliances that include SEAs, LEAs, nonprofits, other stakeholders that will dig deeply into a single important topic. And that topic may be college readiness, that topic may be kindergarten preparedness, it may be uh, ELLs. But these folks are working together on defining the problem, starting off with simple, rich, descriptive data, and building up to more sophisticated work. But the idea is to really kind of go deep on a handful of topics uh, involving um, multiple stakeholders. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this, but if you're interested in it, uh, IES sponsors uh, a research topic called Evaluating State and Local Programs and Initiatives that also requires partnerships between researchers and SEAs and LEAs. And what we're trying to do there is help um, agencies who are rolling out big programs or policies 
evaluate these rigorously. So we'll pay for the evaluation. We won't pay for the implementation. Uh, but it has to be a rigorous evaluation. We've got a, a number of these going across the country right now that are working very well. There's one in Michigan State that kind of forced its flagship universities, the University of Michigan State, to work together on them. And it's been successful enough that the State Department is saying, well, they're, they're now reaching out for more partners for other initiatives. But let me conclude with a, a conclude this part. Uh, um, with a new request for applications that we just put out uh, a week ago, that's called um, Researcher Practitioner Partnerships in Education Research, that will fund partnerships composed of research institutions and state or local agencies, and who come in as equal partners. They're required either to, uh, to be a co-PI or co-PI on each. And the idea is that they, with the input from the SEA, LEA, choose a topic of great interest to them, begin with some preliminary, descriptive, exploratory research and spend two years developing a more in-depth research proposal to submit to IES. So we're thinking of it, this will be a local need, it will be a partnership, but what we want it to do is lead to further development or further efficacy uh, testing. It's the first time we've done this, I will see how it goes. Okay, I'm gonna shift to my part two which I want to stress is really me, um, not the government. But I want to talk about two things, uh, two topics where I think we, we desperately need research right now. Uh, one is around teacher evaluation, uh, and the other one is around non-cognitive outcomes. And these are both kind of pet things for me. And I sort of had the opportunity to talk to a bunch of researchers, so I can't miss this. But I think this teacher evaluation issue is one of the toughest issues in front of us right now. And you, you just can't escape, you can't go a day without reading about it in the newspaper, about a lawsuit around it, about some confrontation about this. And it's clearly a very complex and tricky issue. Uh, it's fraught with a lot of very difficult technical questions that a lot of researchers have thought long and hard about. Uh, but I think equally important and difficult are some of the ethical issues that we're seeing come up. Uh, should teacher evaluations be part of a public record? Uh, should have pa parents have the right to know more about their teachers, their children's teachers? How do we get this balance? Uh, between transparency and privacy, right? But actually, I think the biggest uh, question for us as researchers and measurement type is how do we make the best and optimal use out of what we know is imperfect data? So I think there are two things we do. We, we don't want to make consequential decisions based on faulty data. But I think at the same time, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, and, and I think that we researchers kind of, here's a topic where we should really be just throwing ourselves right into the fray. Uh, everywhere across this country, states and districts, they're developing and implementing teacher evaluation systems, uh, many of which include components of student achievement, uh, student growth, and I think these districts and states really need the kind of skills and expertise uh, that we have. Uh, first of all, to keep them out of trouble. Uh, stop them from doing something potentially damaging. But I think there's a much bigger positive uh, potential here too as well, because I think really good teacher evaluation systems uh, can be really productive very helpful, salutary, not just for districts, but for teachers themselves. Because I think good teacher evaluation can help improve teaching. Uh, it can help improve student learning. It can help administrators make better decisions. 
And I think it can help lead to better teacher training, better teacher induction, better professional development. So it's really a huge topic. Um, much of it is focused around the controversies around the use of value add. But any good teacher evaluation system needs to have multiple components that are going to be combined in different ways for different purposes. And they're going to be combined in different ways probably at different stages of teachers' careers for different uses. So aside from the student achievement or the value add, we've got classroom observations by principals, tiers, and peers, and by uh, outside observers. Um, we've got some really interesting work coming out about how useful student reports are. Um, principal holistic ratings have proven to be very uh, useful. What about teacher self-assessments, parent ratings? What about the idea of scoring the inter intellectual quality of student work artifacts? Um, so there are probably dozens of things like this that could be part of a robust teacher evaluation system. So I'm really a call, a call for the research community to really get out there and help a school, a district, or a state develop, test, and evaluate uh, these teacher evaluation systems. It's a real sort of a crying need. Um, and, and, and we know how to do this stuff. We're trained to do this. So we should be out there helping. OK, number two, where I think the research and evaluation community ought to uh, get more engaged. And I'm not uh, pointing fingers saying why you shouldn't. I think there's a good reason why there hasn't been, this hasn't been as popular. So I want to uh, set, the, this is the non, I'm going, I'm going down the non-cognitive uh, route here, but let, let me set this up and talk about a study that uh, got a ton of press about two months ago. It was called The Long-Term Impacts of Teachers, Teacher Value Added and Student Outcomes in Adulthood. And it was by Raj Chetty and John Friedman at Harvard and Jonah Rokoff at Columbia. So, so these guys assembled this just enormous database with about two and a half million records from two and a half million kids all the way from the early grades uh, to 10 to 12 years later. And they matched education records with of the same kids, okay? So that they have these long-term outcomes that we care so much about. Uh, things like earnings, college attendance, and teenage births. So um, these researchers found that if a student had one high-value add teacher in uh, grades four through eight, and they defined one highly high value add is being one standard deviation above mean. Just one of these teachers uh, in that period of middle grades, that those kids were more likely to attend college when they were more likely to be in college when they were 20, have steeper earning trajectories, and many fewer teenage births. Okay? So here's more evidence, more in the arsenal to say that good teachers really matter, but not just in the short term and in the long term. So what I think is really fascinating about this is that the high value add teachers gave their students a significant bump up in learning the year after they had them. But this bump that the kids got from a really good teacher Two-thirds of that bump faded out within a couple of years. And this is kind of a common finding in edu education research, that just after an intervention, you see a short-term bump and it goes away. But in this case, um, even though there was fade out in the test score improvement, these distal outcomes, college going, earnings, avoiding teenage uh, pregnancies, uh, were there. And those are the things that, that really matter for these kids. So, you know, what's going on here? So my untested hypothesis is that I think the effective teachers 
who were determined as being affected based on the value adds, uh, they, they, they did improve their kids, boost their kids' achievement rates, even though they slacked off later. But I think at the same time, they were boosting really important other skills. Uh, that may, skills or traits that maybe maybe psychological constructs. Things like grit, perseverance, self-control, engagement, emotional intelligence, social emotional learning, sense of mastery. So these are things that I, I think are extremely valuable and that both uh, we in the measurement and research community and our partners in schools and districts should be more mindful. Uh, it's clear to me that the accountability movement of the last decade has really kind of pushed these to the side. Uh, so non-cognitive and soft skills is a little bit of a derogatory term, um, but I think they really belong back on the front burner. Uh, just a little bit, let me talk about grit. Um, this idea, which means exactly what you think it means, uh, perseverance and passion for long-term goals. So a psychologist named Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania, a young scholar, has done a great deal of research. And she and her colleagues, uh, I'm quoting, so grit entails working strenuously toward challenge, maintaining effort and interest over years despite failure, adversity, and plateaus of progress. A gritty individual approaches achievement as a marathon. His or her advantage is stamina. Whereas disappointment or boredom signals to others that it's time to change course, trajectory, and cut losses, the gritty individual stays the course. So you can measure grit very reliably with a very simple scale that asks questions like, setbacks don't discourage me, uh, I am diligent. I have overcome setbacks to conquer an important challenge. So what I think uh, is really cool about this idea of grit, well, it, it's related to self-concept, but it's not the same. It is not related to IQ, okay? Um, and in a whole series of really neat studies, Duckworth and her colleagues have shown that grit will consistently uh, predict successful outcomes over things uh, like intelligence, self-control, grade point average. Uh, for example, grit predicted which freshman cadets made it through the summer training in their first year at, at West Point better than all the other predictors. Uh, grit predicted which children succeeded in the national spelling. Uh, so uh, another kind of related concept, uh, the quest for mastery. Uh, 25 years ago, my dissertation advisor, Benjamin Bloom at the University of Chicago, studied highly successful adult swimmers, pianists, tennis players, neurologists, and mathematicians by conducting uh, intensive interviews with them, their parents, and their coaches. Uh, he and his colleagues wrote a, a wonderful book called Developing Talent in Young People. And one of the most striking findings from the study was the huge investment, a commitment, time, and energy that these young people and their families made in developing their skills. It, it wasn't just hard work that led to success, though. It was a kind of focused and deliberate and strategic effort. Uh, there's a new book by Jeff Cole, Holden called Talent is Overrated. And it makes the same point that success isn't just about uh, luck or talent or a combination of them, but it's about what he calls deliberative practice, which is a kind of practice that's really designed specifically to improve performance. Uh, a little bit more here. Um, I'm going back a little bit to another University of Chicago uh, researcher, a guy named Mihai Csikszent Mihai, who wrote this absolutely wonderful book called Flow, 
the psychology of optimal experience. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this and you know the idea. So flow is that kind of state of mind when you sort of get so engaged at the task at hand that you sort of lose track of your sense of yourself, you lose track of the sense of time. And in early work uh, talked about how people who experience flow, mainly long distance runners or rock climbers, but computer programmers, writers, artists, who just get so engaged in what they're doing that they experience this uh, marvelous sensation of flow. Now, I, I, t I totally kind of became enamored of this uh, idea that here we've got a really respected academic who made a career of studying this, who built a theory around it, a program of research. And I find myself thinking about flow and how important that is. Um, I think about it, it's important to me personally. I mean, that's how I get to enjoy my job when I enjoy it. But I think about how uh, useful it can be in the workplace to make it enjoyable and productive for employees. Uh, I especially think how important it is for kids to learn to have these sort of optimal experiences that will motivate them, encourage them, sustain. Uh, actually, these, uh, I think these kinds of experiences can change lives. As Chief Samahai said, it is the full involvement of flow rather than happiness that makes for excellence in life. So grit, striving for mastery, and throw, I think they're really sort of uh, very interconnected ideas. Uh, there's a, a new book called, by Dan Pink called Drive, The Surprising Truth About what motivates us. So he makes this argument of the interconnectedness among these things, that kids having had this chance to experience flow are much more likely to put in the kind of effort that it takes to strive for mastery and actually become grittier. So I, I think there's a science here for us. These are, these are measurable constructs. I think that they're teachable constructs. What we, at IES, we call these malleable. Uh, but, but they're also uh, lead to improved academic performance. But I think we need to be more upfront and embracing how important they are on their own right. So that's, that's the personal call to research it. So I'm going to conclude pretty quickly and talk a little bit about what I think um, uh, you graduate students here and your faculty members should be thinking about uh, in training the next generation of education researchers. So who will, to build greater understandings, how to improve schools, uh, schooling, and so forth. So I'm drawing uh, these ideas from a couple of discussions that I've been a part of over the last couple of years. Uh, one was at a research conference that was specifically uh, talking about how to build education as an explanatory science. And the other one was a convening of, of researchers who work in partnerships with schools. There were people from my old organization in Chicago. There were people from a group called the New York, the New York City Alliance for uh, research Alliance and from a group called the Strategic Education Research Partners. So here's some of the key points about this. Um, the first is that we should be thinking about building a new professional identity uh, in the education research community and sort of an educational equivalent of engineering. Uh, so these would be really action-oriented researchers who are trying to, at the same time, generate longer-term knowledge while solving short-term and mid-term problems. Uh, I think education researchers have to do a better job of really kind of embracing and acknowledge the complexity of teaching. They need to learn more about how schools and districts operate 
And I've got to understand this kind of interconnectedness of what goes on in the classroom, the building, and the, and the district. So that when we think about school improvement, we think about this in a larger system. Uh, and I would throw in a, a better uh, understanding of the importance of social context, including social capital and social resources. I think we could do a better job of building a scientific culture of experimentation in partnership with practitioners and policymakers so that we do uh, more simpler, quicker, cheaper experiments that can lead to improvement in practice and policy. And this also involves our role in the research community in helping build analytic capacity in the SEAs and LEAs. So as they think about new things, they think about how to roll them out in testable ways that can lead to improvements in programs and policy. Uh, I think it's really important for the research community to really recognize the importance of putting substance on an equal par with methods. Uh, sometimes researchers are get over enamored with their methods. And, but but on, the, on the other hand, we develop really good technical skills. We have to learn how to use them uh, in service of the important questions and problems of practitioners. Uh, build a careful theory of action, which I always think begins with really powerful and deep descriptive data that really lays out current practices and outcomes in new and useful ways. So this kind of descriptive work can really help you build the theory of action around a topic of concern and help you think about, well, what's in the black box? Uh, so the more ambitious, explicit thing about theory building. Uh, I'm so glad to hear people here today talk about the interdisciplinary nature of education research, because I think that's our future. Uh, we have to work across disciplines. Um, we have to think more broadly. Um, we have to be more deliberately synthetic when we're doing this cross-disciplinary work. And finally, I think um, something that we don't think about uh, as researchers as much, which I think is really important, is that it takes a special skill set to be able to interact and communicate with practitioners and policy makers. And I think we should be much more deliberate and mindful about developing those skills uh, in our researchers. So I'm going to conclude with a, about a paragraph long quotation that my colleague uh, Tony Bright wrote in an article in the by Delta Kappa summarizing our research around organizing uh, schools for improvement. He's going to speak very specifically about us digging into issues related to poverty and social capital. But I think you'll understand that I'm just using that as, as an example. So as Tony said, but we must also do more than just tell the facts. We must seek to understand, and we must also ask why. To see race and class differences and rates of improvements, and to just stop there without probing deeper, simply creates more fire for conflict among critics and apologists of the current state of affairs. This dysfunctional discourse advances no common understandings and helps no children and no families. What is really going on in these school communities and why are the important tasks of improving schools so difficult to advance? Asking these questions, bringing evidence to bear on them, and in the process of advancing public discourse about the improvement of public education is a vital role that applied social inquiry can and should fill in a technically complex and politically diverse democratic society. In the end, melding strong, independent, disciplined inquiry with a sustained commitment among civic leaders to improving schooling is the only long-term assurance that an education of value for all 
may finally emerge. Thank you very much. I think that many people resonate with the idea of trying to find that balance point between uh, a very quantitative or, or qualitative but very precise methodology and then making things work in partnership with schools. One question I have though is, I, I've been on enough review committees to know that when a research proposal comes in, people can recognize the value of its approach in the community but will use the issues of method most directly to critique the review. And so we end up, it's, it's a very difficult thing to truly implement. Um, and I'm sure you've thought about that, but it's a comment question. I don't know how to get around that. I don't know how to get around that when I review grants myself, let alone how to write grants that get around that. It's a tough one, yeah. Um, especially if you get a room full of strong methodologists who you know, so we're taking small steps in that direction in the, the ratings of relevance, which uh, all IES proposals are rated on five categories, and relevance is one. And uh, we ask that if there is any kind of evidence that this that demonstrates this, this is relevant to a stakeholder, bumps up the ratings in that area, and how we can um, you know, privilege that in the overall scheme um, is, is, a, is a good point. It, it's a challenge. But, but uh, you know, we're trying kind of slowly to move a, commun a whole community here. And, uh, you know, I've got some bully pulpit uh, capacity. Uh, we've got a little bit, little bit of money that we're, we're slowly trying to get there. In some areas uh, that are really important for researchers, and you mentioned, for instance, in fishery evaluation, researchers are faced with some kind of dilemma that it is important for policy making and ODP, but at the same time, there are not much measurable constructs. Uh, or if there are measurable constructs, we don't have much operational definition for those constructs. So I wanted to know in cases like that, it is difficult to actually prepare a good proposal to present because reviewers are going to criticize the lack of operational definition of the measurement. So areas like that, what would be your recommendation? Again, as I said, this is extremely important, but we don't have enough, uh, any, any, again, measurable construct is the best for the world. What, what can be done in order to prepare a good proposal? Well, I think from the IES perspective, you know, we have a whole goal on measurement. So, uh, if, it, and, and we would love to fund that kind of work about developing these, operationalizing and developing these constructs. So, so I think there is a way to start on this. Uh, um, but, but on the other hand, I, I also think there are out, folks are out there going 60 miles an hour, uh, in large part thanks to the federal government. Um, and, and I think there's a case to be made for, for helping them. In our latest RFAs, uh, our regular RFAs, we actually put this in as an evaluation, as, a, as an example, hoping that we would attract some proposals around this topic. And here, I, don't, I, think, I, think, uh, I think it's not a mature sign. But I think that certainly the work that the Gates Foundation has sponsored over the last couple of years, the um, MET Measuring Effective Teachers Project has really pushed the field. It's also demonstrated what a relatively large investment can do in a very short period of time. So I think there's a foundation there that, uh, that, that, is, made, that, that is helping to make this field more respectable and fundable. Uh, many funding agencies evaluate the qualities of the PI as critical in determining whether you fund somebody. Have you figured out a way to incorporate flow and grit <laughs> in evaluating the qualities of the PI? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that uh, our reviewers um, 
evaluate quality. Uh, they evaluate uh, experience and they evaluate um, uh, demonstrated expertise. So, so, so I think that when they're evaluating um, personnel in a, in a proposal, they're asking themselves, can these people do what they said to do? And I think that probably uh, does bring in those concepts. I guess a question, uh, part, uh, I see kind of connected things in what you've talked about in terms of interdisciplinarity and partnership across different entities as being really critical. And, and I guess one of my uh, concerns is that I don't know that we're training the next generation of researchers to actually do that. I think we're still stuck in, in this notion that one has to be steeped in one's discipline before one can kind of move to that next level. And I wonder if you've thought about kind of the next level of graduate education, how we can really train researchers to take a different approach, perspective, when they when they tackle these questions. Well, um, IES has tried to do that over, over the last eight years or so. We, we do fund um, pre we have a pre-doctoral training um, program that is requires this interdisciplinary approach. Um, we don't have any current RFAs. We're not quite sure of the future of these programs. Um, but there are a dozen, we funded a dozen or so across the country that, that really required that, bringing together, we don't, we don't say what disciplines have to be there, but it's gonna be economics, psychology, human development, linguistics, uh, sociology, anthropology. Um, and we, and what, where, where I think is a crying need right now is to, is learning sciences and the, uh, more the biological sciences, how to get them in. One of the biggest tensions, and you touched on it, is around working with policymakers, particularly, but also practitioners, is timeliness and um, and good enough information. But you know, you have to make the decision tomorrow, so you make it up on um, whatever information you have available. And and I think Tony Bright's kind of the whole rapid prototyping is one way to to intervene in that. And I wondered if IES is thinking more of trying to promote more sort of funding around the rapid prototyping approach to try to deal with timeliness. It's not a, it's not a front burner issue at IES. We are, we're actually supporting some of that work that Tony Bright is doing uh, because it seems so intriguing. It's this 90-day cycle, rapid, very quick kinds of uh, projects that may lead to further ones. Um, and, 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 and Tony's got this wonderful improvement science work going on that builds in this very quick development, a very quick testing out of things. Um, yeah, I would love to see us in that game. Uh, we're sort of put, we have our toes in the water actually supporting that work that Tony's doing is, is our introduction to it. And we're trying to figure out you know, how that's that's going to play out. What kind of, I'm sure some of the RELs are going to come in with proposals like that, if they haven't already. I think they have already, so. <laughs> yeah. I am, as a, a labor economist, I was really thrilled to hear you highlight the study by Raj Shetty and his colleagues that looks at the long-term um, earnings effects. And I guess I'm curious in my sort of casual conversations with people who work more centrally in education, I'm not always sure they're as sold as I am, certainly, on the value of looking at earnings. And I guess I wonder, from your perspective, do you think that's changing within the community of education researchers? Is that becoming a more, better understood why we might want to look at something like earnings as, a, as an outcome measure? Well, I think we're, you know, we're sort of hung up on test scores. And somewhere in the last two decades, we forgot the fact that, you know, the the real criterion, the real outcome we wanted was student learning, right? Uh, and so this is pushing it even further. You know, success as, to, as, to, as defined by earnings. Um, I just think we've got to be a little broader and, and try to get more mindful of the fact that these test scores are proxies of something else. That, you know, it, school's about learning. It's not about test scores. And we, we, we've lost that. 
and learning has many important implications. And how do we reintroduce this into the conversation uh, is, is, I think, just really important. Uh, it, 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 there are some really you know, well-known economists who have been sort of beating this drum for a while and not necessarily getting the do that they should. So as a follow-up to that, it, it strikes me that in your comments, which I very much enjoyed about the non-cognitive side, that really all of that has to occur. You demonstrate grit, you uh, get into a state mm -hmm. of flow around a particular context, and that that actually, that that intersection between what we might think of as the content and the, those moments of intellectual engagement, and uh, that is what we mean by learning. Um, and so, I, I don't know what the, the question I have, I'm sort of struggling to formulate it, but it's something about that that context ultimately is embedded in and mediated by a learning environment that the student is in. And figuring out how to make those productive learning, truly learning environments, it, that's just really, really messy work. And there are no silver bullets. And it is so dependent on so many variables that I, I struggle with the sort of, um, I struggle thinking about how to situate my work, which I think is centrally about that, but in a very circumscribed way, in these larger contexts. So I guess what I'm asking is for you to, could you comment on that sort of notion of like classroom level, getting in and messing around and thinking about the broad ways in which we can engage kids in that true learning, uh, and how that sort of trickles up into the building district State level kind of stuff. I don't know. It's not a very well-defined question. Sorry. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not. I'm, I'm going to give you a bad answer to it. <laughs> so uh, so the, some of the work that we did in Chicago around this this book, organizing schools for improvement. One of the things that we kept coming back to was uh, how important it was for teachers to work together in this kind of professional community where there was uh, collective responsibility for student learning. And, and this, I, I, I think a lot of this teacher effectiveness has taken us away from the importance of the school as a social organization. So I, I think some of the answer lies in, in that, the ability of teachers to collaborate and work together uh, around the right problems. With, with the kind of expertise that someone like you can bring to bear, I mean, teachers collaborating when they don't, you know, the blind leading the blind isn't doing very good but when teachers collaborate around uh, some uh, meaningful content like you're talking about, I, I think that that's kind of the answer for this. It clearly takes leadership that supports it, and stimulates it, and monitors it, and so forth. But I, I think we've kind of lost um, the importance of the school building itself as, a, as, a, as, the, as the center for school improvement. Something that struck me about the conversations that we've been having today is how rapidly changing the context is and how ill-suited we are in our research process to be able to study the, the rapid changes that are taking place. And so as an example, the school district that I'm working with, we have a, a four-year grant and it started two years ago and the context now has so rapidly changed that my original research plan is really out the window because the control that we hope to have to create a, a, a comparison group has now been totally corrupted. So, but that's the way that the research cycle worked was to have this three-year program. And now I feel like, oh, I need to be studying something radically different to capture what's going on now district-wide as far as math instruction goes. And so I'm wondering how so, uh, an institution like IES can become much more responsive so that I can put in a research proposal for something that needs to happen in three months maybe in order to capture the new change, the new thing that the district wants to try so that we have the resources to study what happens when they do that. 
I don't, I don't know how we can do that. Uh, but it's certainly, you know, one of the, I think one of the biggest problems with, that we're, we're seeing in education right now is this huge instability of the leader. Principals turn over, superintendents turn over so fast that, that nothing ever really gets a, much of a, a chance. Um, and that's what you're experiencing. I mean, it may be changed for the good, but it makes uh, any kind of controlled research very, very um, Do you have any comments on, on you guys, get, you're, you're more active. Yeah, we'll do that more, yeah. Uh, I, th I think only when it's more technical assistance and when it's more um, qualitative work um, to be able to, I mean, and through certainly the regional labs, you've designed in some flexibility and through the comprehensive centers and some of those types of things that are designed to be needs driven, you know, you're able to be much more responsive on the, on the RCTs, you know, I mean, it's a killer. I mean, it, um, and, it, and I think it's one of the reasons why the What Works Clearinghouse ends up with nothing works. Um, because so much changes that you don't know. You haven't really measured whether it works or not because so much has changed. And we certainly found that through our last set of RCTs. But I think um, your better bet is less going through the research side and going through um, some other places for funding. National Science Foundation has some room for some of that. And glad to talk to you because I mean we hear that what you just said and that's kind of the other side of my <laughs> rapid prototyping you know so much of what we do by the time we get it done nobody wants it anymore they're on to new questions and it's you know it's why I think you've been so wise on the lab to have these alliances because those are driven by time and need versus methodology I think so, you know, there's a ton of things I didn't talk about today that I think are really important. Technology, uh, um, what kind of research can we do from the use of technology? I think there are, there, there are probably lots of other really important things. I sort of cherry pick my favorite kinds of stuff, uh, which isn't to say that there isn't a lot of other really important work that needs to be done. I think it's the, uh, about time to end. I want to uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Harold Levine. I'm Dean of the School of Education. And uh, I have, uh, I think I have been inspired tonight and also uh, been in the presence of some real wisdom. Uh, IES, uh, most of you know, is, is relatively new on the, on the landscape uh, compared to a lot of other educational institutions, federal institutions. I think it's benefited by extraordinarily gifted leadership, and that certainly includes its current uh, director. And um, I think today we've seen a new face of IES, uh, not just Dr. Easton's, but you know his 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 vision about where it needs to go. Uh, and that vision, at least the part of it, well, we're all about grit here, and uh, but at UC Davis, but all of uh, really about the the intersection of, 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 of researchers and, and practitioners and, and fundamental alliances is very key to what we do in the School of Education and what we do um, in the Graduate Group of Education and, and more generally um, on the campus. So I want to, normally I would present you as our distinguished speaker with a, a bottle of UC Davis olive oil, but because of federal policies around gifting, I, I'm only going to give you an imaginary one and assume that we won't get in trouble for that. And I couldn't get it through airport security. Get it through airport. Okay, that's right. So, uh, but let, let us uh, thank you again for coming. As Jamal said, it, it's an extraordinary, um, it, your time is extraordinarily valuable. We really appreciate you coming out here and uh, being with us. And uh, we look forward to working with you further. And thank